I remember the first time I saw a TCP segmentation offload in use. I was looking at a trace taken on a Linux server and I couldn't for the life of me think why I was seeing really large TCP segments. So I saw Ethernet frame sizes of 16K bytes um, and I knew the customer didn't use jumbo frame support or anything like that. So it completely threw me. And um, I thought I'd take the opportunity to just take a look at TSO, TCP segmentation offload, by comparing two traces. So before we get into the trace comparison, let's look at some of the theory. Here we see an architectural diagram that shows the basic configuration. Now, the actual TCP IP stacks and the drivers, it's not strictly correct, but it's good enough for our purposes and it simplifies the explanation. So we have a, a process such as a web server delivering data through the TCP IP stack, through a TSO NIC and out through an Ethernet switch to, let's say, a, a PC. We're going to consider the situation where we're running a trace at this point here which is where it would run if you ran TCP dump or Wireshark actually on the server. And then imagine that we are also capturing traffic as it exits the um, Ethernet port on the server. Now what we would see is, for example, if we send a 5 kilobyte TCP segment, we would see that as one 5 kilobyte TCP segment. It wouldn't be chopped up at this point. Then the network interface card and the TSO function of the network interface card would repackage that into multiple TCP segments. So what we see on the outside is we see four packets um, with a total segment length of five kilobytes, not unreasonably. When we see data coming back from the PC, the data will, let's say we imagine that we're sending uh, 2920 bytes of data that would be split across two uh, 1460 byte packets and those will indeed get delivered straight through the network interface card to the user process and so what we see on the trace on the server is we see these 1460 byte segments passing straight through the NIC now this assumes that we're not using a function called large receive offload. Large receive offload can actually repackage these multiple packets into one large packet. Now one important factor here is the sequence numbers still all match up. So the five kilobyte segment, let's imagine that it's got a sequence number of one. When we look on the outside of the network interface card, we find that the first packet outbound will have a sequence number of one and then obviously the sequence numbers follow. So I captured matching traces in a system that looks just like this. I've got a client PC, it's um, talking across the internet to a web server. I'm capturing on the uh, user PC and I'm capturing on the server. And of course where I'm capturing on the server, I'm capturing on the, on the process side of the TCP segmentation offload function. So I'm seeing the big packets, that's, that's the main point. So let's have a look at the traces. So I've taken the two traces and loaded them into a Tribe Lab Workbench and then I've um, run a quick match. It doesn't matter if you don't know about Tribe Lab Workbench but it's just a way of uh, analyzing matching traces. So Workbench has matched, matched all the packets for us. So you can see that, for example, in the client side trace, uh, packet 983, which uh, you can clearly see here, um, is matched to uh, packet 493, which you see over here in the server trace. So that's all it's done for us. Um, now, what you do notice is that it's, it's, it's got the matches. So it's match there, match there, match there, but it doesn't match here. Then it matches, then it doesn't match. And this is uh, something that you would see when you're looking at uh, TSO.
TCP segmentation offload. And let's have a look at what that looks like in the traces. So here are the traces. I'm using a filter in both traces of tcp.len greater than zero. This is just so that it eliminates um, all of the standalone acknowledgements and I can just look at the uh, data flows. So here we see the first packet that I'm going to look at. We can see that this is going um, from the client PC to the server to point port 80 on the server. And we see the matching packet down here in this trace. Now, if I move through this trace, you'll see what happens. Now I move to this one and indeed the uh, trace entry down here moved as well. So um, we had uh, this, this packet here as matched to this packet here. But as I move to the next one, you can see there's no movement in the bottom trace. And then I move again, it moves. I move again, it doesn't. I move again, it moves. And you can see as we go down through the trace that it's only matching on every other one until we get to that one actually where it's matched um, on both of those packets. Now the key to the key to this is this uh, value, this column here, where I've exposed the TCP segment length in a column. And you can see that the TCP segment length here in all cases is 1380 bytes. But in the server side trace, it's double that, that amount. So we have the server side trace showing that it's sending a single um, segment of 2760 bytes. And then that results in two, um, two segments up here, these two here. It takes two segments to actually send that traffic across the network once it's gone through the TCP segmentation offload. I've now added an additional column in my Wireshark setup and uh, the column I've added is the sequence number. So now we can see all of the sequence numbers for the individual TCP segments. I've enabled relative sequence numbers to make things simpler and if you were analysing the traffic that was across a TSO function and that TSO function actually fiddled with the sequence numbers, then you could overcome that confusion of having completely different ranges of sequence numbers by using relative sequence numbering uh, in both traces. So that's worth bearing in mind. Anyway, that's uh, what I'm using here. And we can see that we're at the very start of a session here and we have a marker and we see that it has a sequence number of one and then the traffic coming back in the opposite direction, the first segment has a sequence number of one, and we see that indeed it matches down here to sequence number one in the server trace. If we go to the next packet, we notice that we've got a sequence number of 1381, but that doesn't match down here. And that's because 1381 is at the midpoint in this segment in the server trace. So this segment starts at sequence number one and ends at 2761 because we add the, those two together. And so uh, you can see that this one falls in the middle of that range. And then we start another 2760 byte block. And this time we've got a sequence number of 2761 and that matches down here. And we can see as we keep going down the trace, every other one matches. So that just ties up the idea that we can still analyze the traffic in the standard way. We just have to bear in mind that the packets will be repackaged once they come out of the TSO function onto the actual uh, wire into the switch. So I hope that helps and I'll speak to you soon.